All right, let's get started for the last CFA colloquium of the semester. Uh, we have with us today Joe Bovey from the University of Toronto. Joe received his PhD from NYU. Then he was a, a long-term member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Uh, and as of last year, is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Joe uh, holds a uh, Canadian research chair in galactic astronomy and was this year one of, the, one of the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellows. Joe is the, one of the leading experts in the study of the Milky Way, both the galactic dynamics and its stellar populations. He's been a leader in one of the Sloan surveys, uh, the Apogee program, studying um, uh, stars in the H-band. And so today he's going to tell us about streams and fundamental physics. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation to give this talk. I've been here for a few days, and it's been a really great time. Uh, so yes, today uh, I do a lot of work on the disk and studying stellar populations in the disk, but I want to talk about something completely different uh, for the, the next hour. Uh, in, in particular, I want to talk about tidal streams uh, and how they relate to my somewhat bombastic title here, how they can tell us about fundamental physics. So hopefully at the end of the hour you'll be convinced that we can use uh, streams of stars in the Milky Way halo to learn something about fundamental physics. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll see whether I convince you. Uh, so the main motivation is to learn more about the, the basic constituents of our universe. Uh, we know uh, that the regular atoms that we all know and love only make up a very small fraction of the total energy budget of the universe, and that dark matter uh, is about six times, five to six times more abundant uh, than regular matter, and that there's also this dark energy component uh, that is in some ways uh, much more mysterious. And so we'd like to know uh, much more about the dark matter uh, because we don't know all that much of it. Uh, so just to introduce the subject, let me just remind you a little bit about you know, what we do know about dark matter that is very robust. Uh, so the most, uh, the most robust things that we know about dark matter uh, probably come from the observations of the cosmic microwave background, which can tell us uh, in great detail uh, what the, component, the different components of the universe uh, contribute to the energy budget, in particular uh, from the location of the peaks uh, and the height of the peaks. These are uh, very sensitive to how much dark matter there is in the universe. It's just a little movie uh, that shows you in particular that this third peak uh, is really sensitive, and the ratio of the third to the second peak is very sensitive uh, to the non-baryonic uh, matter in the universe. Uh, and so from this we know that there is this very large uh, amount of dark matter in the universe. We also know from uh, much earlier times from the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, we can measure uh, the baryon fraction uh, in a completely independent way, uh, and that also agrees uh, with this, uh, this, that it's only 5%. Uh, so we have, from the early universe, we have a very good understanding uh, uh, of the, the kind of total uh, matter budget in the universe. So we know that there is this very large component of, of non-baryonic dark matter in the universe. Uh, but you know, beyond its its actual uh, uh, you know, abundance, uh, we'd like to know much more about it. Uh, so one thing that we know is that cold dark matter, uh, dark matter must be relatively cold, uh, and that uh, this is telling us something about the initial conditions uh, of dark matter uh, when it decouples from other, uh, from other uh, components of energy. Uh, so we know that dark matter cannot, have been cannot be relativistic over the history of the universe, for example, if it was some neutrino or something, because then uh, we would see uh, structure would form very differently uh, and in particular, at early times, uh, here's just some simulation for relativistic uh, dark matter, you would see very little structure uh, on large scales in the universe. Uh, and yet, when we look at, we make observations, we see that there's many high redshift galaxies. We know that there's very large, uh, massive black holes, quasars at high redshift. So we know that structure forms uh, very early in the universe. Uh, and so we know that this cannot be the case, and so that dark matter cannot be relativistic. But it could still, we don't know much. Uh, about its initial velocity. So the simplest model is that there is essentially the velocity of dark matter has no effect on, on structure formation, where it is you know, it's incredibly cold to begin with. Uh, and then we get lots and lots of structure on, on, in the universe. Uh, and in the, the universe today, we would expect uh, large halos uh, that host galaxies like the Milky Way uh, to have lots of substructure in them. Uh, but if, if dark matter has some velocity that is uh, not relativistic today, but that was uh, relativistic at very early times, uh, it would still wash out some of the structure, uh, but this would still be in a way that's compatible with the high redshift universe, and we would get less structure today. And so this would, if we could actually distinguish between these two models, 
uh, that, was, that would teach us something about the fundamental uh, nature of dark matter. Um, so just to summarize this, very, this first very general part, uh, if we just assume that dark matter is cold, it also doesn't have any significant interaction with itself or with, uh, with ordinary matter. If you uh, take that model, we can predict the CMB uh, that we see from Planck uh, in great detail. Uh, and we can also run uh, like forward what we should see today in the universe and look at the, the kind of large scale amount of structure through the power spectrum here at low redshift or through baryon acoustic oscillations uh, in the low redshift universe. And these, just this very simple model of dark matter uh, explains all of these, uh, these, these, uh, these observations on large scales uh, very beautifully. Uh, of course, that's still, you know, we don't know much about the fundamental nature of dark matter, so could we say anything more interesting that is just, than just that it's cold and collisionless? Uh, so one thing that people uh, do is, uh, for particular candidates of dark matter, you can actually try to find uh, evidence of, of dark matter from, uh, for example, scattering off of ordinary matter. Uh, so for example, one of the most popular models for dark matter uh, has been, for the last few decades, that it's a weakly interacting uh, massive particle. So this is a particle, uh, a hypothetical particle with a mass that's something like a few times a proton mass or maybe a hundred times a proton mass, and it would have an interaction strength uh, that is something like of the order of the weak scale. Um, and so in this, in this model, you can very naturally explain why there is six times, five to six times more dark matter in the universe than there is ordinary matter. And so that's uh, that, because of that kind of miraculous uh, feature, the Wimp miracle, uh, this, this has gotten a lot of attention. And in these, uh, and because there you have this weak scale interaction uh, between uh, dark matter and ordinary matter, this means that if you just get a lot of ordinary matter together, uh, you can look for uh, signatures of dark matter interactions uh, with, this, uh, with this ordinary matter. So you take, for example, some very large amount of some liquid uh, noble gas, uh, and you just sort, you put it uh, down in a mine or something, you just shield it from any other influence, and sometimes uh, a dark matter density, a, a dark matter particle should just pass by one of these atoms and disturb it, and you would, uh, it would uh, give off some signal that you can uh, detect. And so people have been building a bigger and bigger experiments like this to look for this kind of interaction, and this allows you to put a, a, a limit on the cross-section of, of dark matter off of nucleons. Um, so for example, here's just the latest update on those searches. So they've been pushing down uh, towards smaller and smaller cross-sections for the last few decades. Uh, and these are, uh, these are the latest limits that were published this summer. So, uh, uh, so you get a very tight constraints, uh, just to give you a sense of where you expect these models to lie, just kind of the most naive uh, of these models that people wrote down very early on, uh, a particular model for these, these WIMPs would have a cross-section that would be what's up here. Uh, so this is, you know, six orders or seven orders of magnitude above the current best limits. And while you can uh, write down models that are still uh, kind of, you know, natural in some, you know, sense of that word uh, in, these, in these particle physics models, uh, for example, this I'm showing here, uh, and I'm not an expert in this, but uh, it's becoming kind of unnatural to get a, this small of a cross-section and still get this kind of miraculous uh, uh, WIMP uh, behavior where you have this six times as much uh, dark matter as ordinary matter. Uh, and so this means that this, you know, this, this model, which has been you know, in many ways uh, dominating what people think about dark matter, especially uh, in kind of like uh, us astronomers who aren't uh, experts in all of the different dark matter models, this is becoming kind of ruled out. And, and the next generation of, of experiments will push this down all the way to a fundamental limit uh, that comes from neutrino scattering. Uh, and so it's going to be hard to do much better than that. So we really need to, to find other ways to learn something about dark matter. Um, and so what I'm uh, going to focus on in this talk is some astrophysical ways uh, to do this, in particular in the local universe in the Milky Way. Uh, and uh, so already I showed this simulation of what happens if dark matter is warm uh, at early times uh, or if it's completely cold. And so one thing uh, that you saw there was that you would uh, get much more small scale structure, so small scale uh, dark matter over densities in a halo like the Milky Way uh, if dark matter has some, uh, some non-trivial physics. And so you know, measuring how much small scale structure exists in the dark matter distribution in the Milky Way uh, would give us some uh, constraint on all the different kind of uh, models for dark matter that there are. There's, you know, really, if you 
look at the particle physics models of something like 80 orders of magnitude for what the mass of the, part, for the dark matter particle could be. So any constraint like this uh, would, would significantly uh, change the, that range, for example. Um, also, the inner structure of halos is very uh, sensitive to the, uh, the particle nature uh, of dark matter and the possible interactions between dark matter particles. Uh, so this is in particular the overall density, especially the density of, in the core of these galaxies will be, uh, is predicted to be uh, very cuspy if dark matter is just a cold collisionless particle. Uh, but for example, if dark matter has some self-interaction uh, or if it's warm, uh, we'll have some, a, a lower density uh, and potentially even make a core in some of these models. Uh, so you can use the radial profile to see whether you have a cuspy profile near the center or not. Uh, and you, also, you can also use the shape uh, because if there's some sort of self-interaction uh, in the dark sector, that will also change uh, the shape of the, of the, of the halo. Um, and so these are all things that we can uh, potentially measure in the Milky Way. So I'll talk about some ways to do this uh, with tidal streams in the talk. Uh, so I'll first uh, give a kind of general uh, overview of the uh, kind of physics of tidal streams, how they form, and how we can build very simple models of them. And then I'll use these simple models to measure the shape of the Milky Way halo uh, from observations of the PAL-5 and GD1 streams. Uh, and then I will, in the second part of the talk, uh, we'll talk about how we can use the same kind of modeling uh, to actually use uh, me uh, uh, measurements of the density profile of streams uh, to limit how what, what amount of small-scale structure there is in the Milky Way halo. Uh, okay, so let me start by just uh, introducing tidal streams. Uh, so tidal streams that I'll be talking about uh, come from objects like globular clusters or dwarf galaxies that orbit in the Milky Way potential and that are being uh, tidally disrupted due to the tidal forces from the, from the overall Milky Way potential. Uh, and these are objects on eccentric orbits. So here's just a a, a little end body simulation uh, to illustrate that for you. So there's, there's a little uh, blue dot uh, is a, something of a, like a globular cluster that's orbiting in a potential the Milky Way that's not shown. Here it's just, this is just centered and co-moving with the cluster. Uh, and what you see is that, that, part, that some of these particles that are coming out of the cluster, uh, they just get put on an orbit that's slightly different uh, from the orbit of the, of the cluster. And because of that, their frequencies are slightly different and their orbits, uh, their energies are slightly different. So they start going a little bit faster uh, than the globular cluster, which means that they, uh, they kind of slowly drift away from it. And because particles uh, get, uh, get uh, removed from the globular cluster uh, periodically, uh, this leads to this kind of tail of, of stars that come out uh, from, the, from this globular cluster. And the same thing happens uh, with dwarf galaxies, uh, which are also tightly disrupted. Uh, so this is you know, a very simple dynamical process uh, that we expect to happen in the Milky Way. And one of the great things that SDSS did was to actually find lots and lots of evidence for this in the halo of the Milky Way. So this is the famous field of streams uh, from SDSS. Uh, these are just uh, stars in the halo uh, uh, and, and just shows you a, a kind of density map of these stars uh, at different distances. Um, and so you see that there's a lot, this is not just a smooth distribution of stars in the Milky Way halo. You see that there is this very large feature here that is the Sagittarius stream, which was uh, known before SDSS, but it very clearly shows up here. That's an incredibly large overdensity in the halo. You know, a significant fraction of stars in the halo are part of Sagittarius. Uh, so this is, we know that there's a Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. So this is one of these uh, tidal disruptions uh, in, 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 pr in the process of happening. Um, but then you see also that there are smaller streams here. I don't know whether with the contrast you can see it very well, but there's a, there's a stream that goes out here kind of straight. That's called the orphan stream. Uh, it's called the orphan stream because we don't know what the progenitor of it is. Uh, but because of the width, which you can't see very well, but it's about this wide, uh, it seems like it probably is coming from also a small dwarf galaxy rather than a globular cluster. Uh, but uh, the kind of nicest uh, example of a globular cluster stream that we have is the Palomar 5 stream, uh, which comes uh, from the Palomar 5 globular cluster, which is sitting right there. And you see it very clearly uh, in, this, in this field of streams here, where you get this incredibly narrow uh, stream of stars uh, with, a, with two tails coming out uh, from the Palomar 5 stream. And so we know that these, uh, there's lots and lots of structure uh, from these tidal tails, uh, just like we expect uh, from these uh, very simple dynamic simulations. Uh, OK, so I want to talk about. Uh, Two things in particular, as I said, just the overall shape of the halo and the 
and the lumpiness. So I'm going to take a few slides to give a somewhat technical overview of uh, how we can model tidal streams. So here's just the motivation uh, for that, just to get you through the next few slides. Uh, so I'll show results in the second part of the talk for how we can uh, measure the, the axis ratio, the shape of the halo, uh, using observations from the Palomar 5 stream. So these are shown here. So we have measurements of the Palomar 5 globular cluster. It's shown is here. It's not shown. And then we have measurements of where the stream is on the sky in, in just RA and DAC here. Uh, and we have measurements of the velocity along the stream. And so these are just these lines are just models in a galactic potential with different uh, shapes of the halo of where the stream is expected to lie uh, based on the the, the phase space position of, of Palomar 5 in the galactic potential. And so we, you see that we can we can draw these very smooth models here, and there is quite a bit of a range in where you expect the stream to lie uh, as you change the shape of the halo. So these are so it's a very this this data is very sensitive, obviously to the shape of the halo. And so I'll talk a little bit about you know, how we can actually very easily make these very smooth uh, models for how we, for where we expect the stream to lie. Uh, and this, uh, on the right here, illustrates uh, the second part of the talk, uh, where here is now shown uh, star counts along the trailing arm of the, of the PAL-5 stream, so more detailed observations than along this part of the stream, uh, of the actual density along the stream. And you see that there's lots of structure, there's this large bump here, and then there's uh, dips uh, and peaks in this uh, in this density structure, uh, and so here we in the middle panel just divide this out as like an overall uh, overall gradient. Uh, but then you see there's still lots of once you take out overall gradients and the density, there's lots of small scale structure left here. Uh, and so uh, the point of the second part of the talk will be to ask the question of how can we use this small scale structure uh, to actually measure how often the stream has interacted with dark matter subhalos. And here's just a very simple, uh, here's an example of a simulation where it has interacted with a, a set of subhalos, where the subhalos are three times as abundant as you kind of naively expect in the cold dark matter universe. And you see that you get, you know, you get also these kind of uh, same kind of wiggles uh, in, the, in the density profile. And so this we can also very easily compute uh, with very simple models of tidal streams. And so this is, you know, you see that there are very, uh, very precise uh, tools for learning about the shape and the small scale structure of the Milky Way halo. Um, okay, so, so the big challenge for all of these projects is how do we efficiently model the stream uh, so that we can, we can build many of these models to run like some Monte Carlo uh, chain uh, of the, you know, to constrain the actual potential, or how can we efficiently do many, many simulations of the impacts of substructure on tidal streams so we can make simulations like this and compare it to the data that we have at hand. Uh, so for this, we need a, a fast method. And so people have, have done uh, various things in the past. Uh, so the simplest assumption that you can make is that a stream is actually just a, a single orbit uh, in the halo. Uh, there's no real good reason to make this assumption, I think. Uh, but it's very simple, because everybody knows how to integrate an orbit. Uh, and, and it's very fast, because integrating a single orbit is a very uh, easy thing to do. Um, and it's also, it turns out, it is actually quite close to the correct. Uh, but it is actually, it's slightly wrong, um, and it's wrong in a way that really uh, affects what you uh, learn about the potential. So if you, if I were to draw these point, these, these lines just for orbits rather than actual models of the stream, uh, they would, they would lie much closer together, for example. Uh, and so you would, if you run, if you infer the shape of the halo based on, or on models with the stream as an orbit, you would get the, a very wrong answer. So it, it's a, it's slightly wrong, but it's been done many times in the literature, unfortunately. Um, then uh, at the other uh, extreme, uh, what you can do is you can just run full n-body simulations of the disruption, just like the movie I showed a few slides ago. You just instantiate a cluster of stars, and you just let it disrupt uh, self-consistently in an external potential. Uh, so that's, you know, obviously it's quite easy to do. You just have to run an n-body simulation, uh, but running n-body simulations is still uh, quite expensive, even if you only use, like, you know, a few tens of thousands of particles, which is, you know, enough to do this, but it would still take you like an hour or so uh, to do a single simulation uh, accurately enough. Uh, so uh, this is very expensive, but it's clearly correct. So in some sense, you know, it's what we should be doing. Um, now, but it's too expensive. So uh, kind of something you could do that's in between is rather than just uh, self-consistently simulate how the cluster disrupts, uh, you can just uh, integrate a model cluster forward in time, and at certain times you just say, oh, I remove a star from the cluster, 
uh, and you put it at a distance, uh, at a slight distance and a slight velocity offset from the cluster, uh, just to say, oh, it's been tidally stripped, and it's now just slightly outside of the tidal radius, has a slightly different velocity. Uh, and then you can just say, well, from now on, it doesn't feel, uh, it's not bound to the cluster anymore, so I'm just going to integrate the orbit uh, in the forward in the Milky Way potential. You could even, you can put in uh, the cluster potential as well, uh, but you just don't put in like any individual interactions with particles in the cluster anymore. And so then you're again in this, in this, in the regime where you're doing orbit integration, uh, which is very simple. Uh, you just solve you know, these equations of motion, uh, and then you just integrate them forward. But you still have to do uh, hundreds of orbits to do this properly. And what you get, end up with in the end is just a Monte Carlo sample along uh, the stream, which you have to build a smooth model for the stream out of. Uh, so this is, uh, it's, you know, it's much faster than doing the end body simulation, and you get the stream uh, roughly correct. Uh, but you, in the naive way, you just get a Monte Carlo sample in the end, uh, which is uh, kind of hard to use. Um, so uh, one, the approach that I've been taking is to uh, work in a set of coordinates called action angle coordinates, uh, which you may be familiar with. Uh, so this is just a, a different set of coordinates to look at, at orbits in. And I don't want to spend too much time explaining what they are. Uh, but you basically do a canonical transformation uh, from position and velocity space to this action angle coordinates. And these coordinates are chosen uh, such that the, the equations of motion become very, very simple in these coordinates. In particular, Hamilton's equations just become uh, these simple equations here, where the action, j, uh, is constant in time. So it just doesn't change across, uh, along the orbit. And then the, the, the angles uh, are just, uh, uh, just increased linearly in time with some frequency that is a function of the actions. Uh, so the dynamics becomes incredibly simple. Uh, the actions are just conserved along the orbit, and you have angles that increase linearly in time. So this is was well shown here. Uh, so you have some orbit here in configuration space that's very eccentric. So you kind of speed up near you know perigalacticon, you slow down near apogalacticon, you go through some complicated uh, pattern here in R and Z. Uh, so that's you know that's the very complicated configuration space dynamics. If you just convert all of this to action angle space, you get this very simple dynamics where the actions are constant, and you get these angles here. These are two of the angle coordinates that just increase linearly in time. Uh, so if you can make the transformation to these coordinates, <clears throat> the problem becomes you know, incredibly simple, and that orbit integration is just analytic. Uh, now, uh, the problem, of course, is to make the coordinate transformation. Uh, to do this, you have to solve a partial differential equation called the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And you know, Hamilton and Jacobi, you know, I'm sure they were very smart people, but they didn't come up with any general way to solve them. Uh, so that has really kept this field back uh, for, for many, many, you know, I guess, hundreds of years. <laughs> uh, just a slight exaggeration here. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, and so you know, while you know, it's been known for a long time that action angle coordinates are obviously the right way to look at streams, in practice, we could not use this because we can't, for a general uh, Milky Way-like potential, actually compute these, these actions and angles for, for orbits uh, in the halo. Now, uh, in the last few years, we've made a lot of progress uh, in this area. In particular, we now have a general method uh, for computing actions and angles for any, uh, any uh, static potential. It can be even a triaxial potential. Which is, uh, you don't have to assume anything about the symmetries. All, the only thing that matters is that it is uh, is that it's static, and you can compute action angle coordinates uh, for regular orbits uh, with this method. Uh, so I don't want to go through all of the uh, details of this method. I just want to uh, convince you here that it is actually incredibly simple. So the solution to this uh, few hundred year uh, old problem turned out to be kind of ridiculously simple. Uh, so what you can do, uh, and you can show mathematically that this works, uh, is that suppose you want to know uh, what the action and the angle is of a of a space in, at a certain position and a velocity. That's this blue dot here. Uh, so you want to know, in my galactic potential that has a disk and a halo, say, uh, what is the action and the angle? Uh, so to do this, you can, uh, what you can do is you can take a different potential, like an isochrone potential, where you can analytically compute the actions and the angles. Uh, so there's a very small class of potentials where we can do this. Uh, the isochrone potential is the simplest one. Uh, and you can integrate the orbit uh, forward in time in the real potential, and then you just compute the actions in the in this wrong potential, this isochrone potential, along the orbit, 
And then you can show that if you just average these, these actions that are incorrect and that are not constant in time, if you just average them, uh, then you get the correct action in the, in the true potential. So here, just to show you that this very quickly converges, so you just integrate this orbit uh, in, the, in the true potential. Uh, this, you calculate the action at every time in this isochrome potential. It just kind of oscillates up and down because it's not, uh, it's not conserved in, this, in, in the wrong potential. And then here shows just the average action, uh, just the average of this. Uh, and what you see is that this very quickly converges, and the dashed line here is the, is the true action for this very simple case. And this is a case where the true potential is a different isochrome potential, so we can actually uh, compute exactly what the correct answer is. Um, and you see that if you just integrate this for you know, a few tens of dynamical times, uh, you, this very quickly converges to a level uh, below a percent. Uh, and so you can very accurately compute uh, the actions even for uh, these eccentric, an eccentric orbit, uh, like the one that's shown here. Uh, so that's very simple to do. Uh, you know, you just have to integrate an orbit and take some averages, and, and you have the, the correct action. Um, and you can show that with a very similar procedure, you can also get the angles and the frequencies. Uh, so that means that we can now actually build models for streams in action angle coordinates and actually use them in practice uh, to, build, uh, to build models for streams and to uh, compare them to data. Uh, okay. So, uh, so then now, let me just very briefly show you what the dynamics of a stream is in these action angle coordinates. So I told you before that the simplest way you can model a stream is just uh, you, you, take, you model a stream star as uh, just being some different delta x, delta v position and velocity away from the progenitor object at some time. Uh, and then you just integrate both of these forward uh, with orbit integration. So that's, uh, you know, that's simple, but time it uh, takes time. Uh, so if you can compute action angle coordinates, what you do is you just take, uh, you just uh, convert the progenitor's uh, orbit to action angle coordinates, and then the stream star's orbit to action angle coordinates. And then the difference in where the difference between these two points is very simple in that the difference in action is just constant in time, and the difference in angle just increases linearly uh, due to the difference in frequencies. Uh, and so, you know, you're, you're your orbit, the, where your star in the stream is compared to the progenitor is just incredibly simple. It's just a, it just evolves linearly in time. Um, and just to give you a sense of, you know, because you probably don't have much of a sense of what uh, kind of deviations in action space uh, would typically are, they're, they're, we, they're not just in kiloparsecs or so, but you could just uh, think that these kind of relative differences between it, within the stream and between the progenitor and the stream are just essentially given by the, the velocity dispersion in the, in, the, in the cluster or the dwarf galaxy uh, divided by the typical velocity of the halos, the circular velocity. And so for globular cluster streams, these are all a few percent in that these are objects with internal dispersions of a few kilometers per second orbiting in the Milky Way potential at a few hundreds kilometers per second. So these are very small differences uh, in, in, in these frequencies and actions. Okay, so this is very simple uh, to do all of these dynamics in, in action angle coordinates. Uh, actually, uh, really, you don't even have to bo bother with actions. Uh, you really only care about the frequencies in that the, the difference in angle just comes from the difference in frequency. So really, you want to build your models uh, in frequency and angle space. And just here, this is the output from the simulation that I showed before uh, in frequency, frequency, and angle, angle space. Uh, so you see that there's just, you know, the stream looks very simple here. It's just a straight line. You get these two clumps due to the, uh, those are the leading and the trailing arm. Uh, and then, and these fall essentially along a single, you know, there's a one dimensional object in this space, essentially. Uh, and so there's this direction that shows you where the stream will spread out. And this is the same direction here uh, along which the angles spread out because the angle differences come from these differences in frequency. So this direction sets the direction in angle space. So a stream is really at the simplest, and uh, the simplest approximation just is one dimensional, one dimensional feature. Uh, and I'll call this the parallel direction, uh, which you, you can just think of as the direction along the stream. Um, and so then we come to what is probably the weirdest thing about me. This is the, how I think of a stream, which pretty much nobody else does. Um, but for me, a stream is, you know, not some thing in the sky that has some curvature and everything. It's really, it lives in this frequency angle space in the parallel direction. So you take, you know, this, this point here and you, you turn it over so that you only care about the parallel direction. 
Uh, and then a stream is essentially some spread in the, in the angle in this parallel direction, which is just along the sky where the stream lies. And then there's a little bit of spread in the frequency in the same direction, which you can think of as the dispersion uh, within the stream, like the velocity dispersion at a given position along the stream. Uh, but then uh, we can build these very simple models in frequency angle space, uh, where you just put very simple kind of Gaussian models for these blobs in frequency, and they allow you to analytically compute, for example, where you expect the stream to lie here uh, on average as a function of the angle. Uh, and then these points come from the n-body simulation again. Uh, so we capture overall very well uh, the structure of the stream. Uh, we don't capture these, these, uh, these stripes here because these come uh, because uh, most of the mass loss happens at pericenter. Uh, and this is in the simplest model. We don't include these. We just assume that, uh, model, that stream stars come out at, any, at a random time along the orbit. Uh, but for the overall properties here, you see that this doesn't matter all that much. And we, we capture this kind of getting the stream getting colder further away from the progenitor. Sorry, the progenitor, progenitor is at zero uh, angle difference here. Um, we capture all of that correctly. So this is we can build. These are analytic models that we can build that you know you can calculate in like 30 seconds uh, versus this n body simulation which takes an hour to run. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, uh, and then of course we're still you know we don't actually do observations in in frequency angle coordinates, at least not yet. Uh, so you have to then transform your, your system back into configuration space, uh, but you can do this uh, very efficiently because we can compute the, uh, the, the transformation between a configuration space and an action angle space. Uh, so here then, this is the model stream here in this black line, tr uh, transform back into configuration space and just you know, observe from some random position in this, in this model galaxy uh, compared to the and body simulation here, which is these, these black dots. So overall, we, you know, we capture very nicely uh, how this stream uh, looks on the sky, how, what, how proper, proper motion varies. Uh, we can also, you know, if we look at the dispersion there, we also capture that properly. Uh, and so you know, this model, again, just to drive this point home, this black line takes 30 seconds to compute. The end body model takes about an hour or so to run. So this is, you know, if you want to run many, many models of a stream this way, is the way to do it, and you get these smooth predictions. There's no noise in this prediction whatsoever, essentially. Uh, okay, and I'll take a breather. Uh, the kind of technical part of the talk is uh, largely done here, but I hope that you now are convinced that streams are kind of very you know, simple, beautiful, dynamical uh, objects that we can build very simple models for, and therefore, they're very uh, good uh, to actually learn something about dark matter, and that you know they're very there's very little systematics in these objects because we really understand the gravitational dynamics of these objects so well. Uh, so let's now first uh, use them uh, to learn about the overall potential. Uh, so here's PAL-5. I already showed some data for it. Here's the actual some, uh, some uh, more original data from SDSS. So this was found uh, in very early SDSS data. This is from a later data release already than the original discovery. But you see these, you know, this PAL-5 Barbara cluster, and then you see this beautiful trailing tail and leading tail uh, coming out of it. So people have spent a lot of time uh, looking at the stream to get more, uh, to more detailed characterization of it. And so in particular, we have you know, very precise measurements of where the stream is as a function of RA in tech, just on where it is in the sky. Uh, and we also have some data on velocities uh, along of members along the stream. And so we can, uh, we can use these uh, these then to model uh, the potential of the Milky Way. Um, so uh, PAL-5 is uh, about, uh, at about 8 kiloparsec uh, in, in cylindrical distance from the sun, uh, uh, from the galactic center. So it's a very similar distance to the, uh, as where the sun is in the, in the Milky Way. Uh, but it's 17 kiloparsecs above the plane. So it's really in a regime of the Milky Way that's dominated uh, by the halo. Um, and so here's just various models that are all computed with this, this action angle uh, uh, framework, because you can very quickly compute these smooth models of where the stream should be, uh, varying different parameters uh, for the stream. So the most important one uh, for our purposes are here the, the axis ratio of the halo. So this is, we assume that the, that the, that the, halo, that the Milky Way potential has a, just a disk uh, that re represents the stars and gas. Uh, there's some bulge components, and then there's a halo component for the dark matter. Uh, and if you just change 
uh, whether this is spherical or whether it's oblate or prolate, uh, that goes from uh, prolate would be this, this yellow line, oblate would be uh, this purple line, uh, with spherical being kind of uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, you, get, you get very large variations in where the stream would be on the sky, uh, and also variations in the velocity along the stream, uh, especially we have good measurements here along the trailing arm. Um, so that's just the shape of the halo. Uh, you can also just kind of change the overall normalization of the potential, which is basically the overall mass uh, of, the, of, the, of the mass distribution, uh, which is here parameterized by just the circular velocity itself. Uh, and that would also change, for example, you know, very significantly if you change the circular velocity between 200 and 250 kilometers per second, uh, would you know, give pretty large changes in where the stream is in the sky and also in the line of sight velocity. And then there's, uh, you also need to know what the position and the velocity of the, of the PAL-5 cluster itself is. As if you change those, for example, we don't quite know what the distance to PAL-5 is. If you change those, uh, you also get very large differences. If you change the proper motion of PAL-5, uh, for which we have some measurements, but uh, they're not perfect. Uh, and so within the uncertainties, you still get you know, pretty large differences in where you expect the stream to lie. Uh, so you really have to marginalize over all of these these different uh, parameters to learn about the potential. But one thing that you, uh, you should notice here is that in all of these three panels, uh, the dependence of both the position of the sky and the velocity is always the opposite color scheme here. So you always go from either purple, uh, you go from purple to uh, yellow, and yellow to purple, uh, and that's also the case here, or you go from yellow to purple and purple to yellow. So they're opposite in how they react. Whereas the shape of the halo, uh, you get the same color screen. So you go always from, you go from, from, uh, from yellow to purple and from yellow to purple, uh, which means that uh, basically how these change uh, where the stream lies are completely orthogonal to each other. And so you can essentially measure the shape of the halo independent of all of these parameters uh, because they change the, the observations in orthogonal ways. Uh, so this means that PAL-5 is really a, an excellent uh, way to measure the shape of the halo. Um, so then, uh, to do this and to marginalize over all of our uh, uncertainties in you know, distance and, and, and proper motion, and we also make, take different uh, models for the, for the Milky Way disk and the Milky Way halo, uh, and so we run many, many fits in all of those doing MCMC exploration. Uh, so then one question is, how do you like, actually summarize all of that information? Uh, and to do that, uh, we just uh, we express the measurement here uh, rather than expressing it as some constraints on parameters of a parameterized model for the halo, uh, we just assume that we measure uh, the, the force component, so the acceleration in the halo, at the position of PAL-5. Uh, and so then for all of the models that we run, this is effectively the prior that we have in this space, just from all of the ones that we consider. Uh, and then when we do our measurement, we get a posterior distribution on this force component, these two components, the radial component and the vertical component, and we've assumed that the halo is uh, axisymmetric, so there's no, uh, there's no third component to the force, this is zero. Uh, so then we get a very tight posterior uh, on, these, on, on this force component, and you can divide the posterior by the prior if you want to know what is the likelihood, so what is the information that just comes from PAL-5 that wasn't coming from the, just the, the set of potentials that we looked at. Uh, and so this is the likelihood, it's very similar to the posterior, and in particular it has this you know, very large uh, difference in axis ratios, so you get, it's very uh, elongated, uh, and it's elongated in such a way that this is, the, uh, this is the line of where the flattening of the potential, the total potential, is constant. So this is, again, uh, saying that we measure the flattening of the potential uh, much better than we measure the overall normalization of the potential. Uh, okay, so this is, you know, one measurement of an acceleration in the halo from PAL-5, so that, you know, it's going to help a little bit with constraining the halo, but uh, by using a different stream, we can uh, get another measurement. Uh, so here's the GD1 stream. It's also uh, found in, in SDSS data. You see it's this 60-degree long stream here. Uh, it's very beautiful in, this, in this, uh, this way that Carl Grillmeyer has of looking at the SDSS data. Uh, it's not that obvious, <laughs> I think, to anybody else uh, you know, before processing, but you know, it really stands out once you look at the data in the right way. Uh, so this is uh, somewhat further from the galactic center in cylindrical coordinates, uh, but a little bit closer to the disk. So it's still it's in a regime where both the, the halo and the disk uh, contribute significantly to the acceleration. Uh, but still, uh, we can run the same kind of models. We have for GD1 
uh, we have a little more data along the stream in that we have, uh, we have measurements here of the position of the stream on the sky. Uh, we have measurements of the distance along the stream to different parts of the stream. Uh, we have some measurements of the proper motion along the stream, and then we have some measurements of the line of sight velocity along the stream. Now, the one thing that we don't have is a progenitor for this object, so we don't know where the progenitor is. So that's a, we need to marginalize completely over where the progenitor of this object is, but we can do that. And so here's just again showing you, uh, if you change, uh, now these plots are the ones that change the shape of the halo, so from oblate to prolate, you get especially large differences in where the stream would be on the sky, and here it just changes, uh, again, in the overall normalization of the potential, which gives you big changes here and smaller changes uh, in these components. So we again can run the same kind of analysis, run many, many Monte Carlo chains uh, to, in different models for the Milky Way potential, and still, and again, constrain uh, the, uh, the force components at some fiducial location that's just kind of picked to be in the center of the stream. And so we again have a prior on this, these two force components and a posterior that comes from fitting to the data as we again get this very tight likelihood. Uh, so we again from this uh, get uh, a very good measurement of the, the acceleration components at the position of, of G1. Um, so then what we could do is, you know, from these two accelerations, we want to learn, you know, what is the shape of the halo. Uh, so what we do uh, to do uh, to do that is we add these data to some other measurements of the Milky Way potential that we have, in particular the H1 uh, terminal velocity curve, some the velocity dispersion in Bada's window uh, to get some sense of the bulge. Uh, we use uh, measurements of the vertical force uh, that we've made uh, in the Milky Way close to the disk, uh, which essentially constrain the scale length of the disk, and then we use some, uh, some measurements of the circular velocity curve out in the halo, uh, and we combine all of these to measure the shape. Uh, so here's just, uh, uh, and then we use a, a parameterized model for the Milky Way, uh, where the disk has some free scale length and scale height. Uh, there's some, uh, the, the halo has a scale, uh, scale length and has a shape parameter. Uh, and then we also vary the distance of the galactic center, the circle of velocity, uh, and the relative normalization of all of these components. So it's a pretty flexible model. Uh, and so here's just kind of constraints that you get on the flattening of the halo compared to all of these other parameters without using any of these stream data. So this is using all the data uh, that we have on the potential, some, you know, some curated collection here, uh, but not putting in these, these new measurements from PAL-5 and GD-1. And you see that we are essentially, there's no constraint on the shape of the halo and that it could be anywhere from very oblate to very prolate uh, based on these data. So there's essentially no constraint. And once you put in PAL-5 and GD-1, these, these contours tighten up significantly, and we find that the halo is essentially spherical with an error bar of something like 15%. Uh, so that just comes from that you can pin down suddenly the accelerations in the halo, uh, which we weren't uh, able to do before. Uh, so here's just a, a visual illustration of the, uh, the potential in the inner Milky Way that comes out of this best fit model. Uh, so this is just a, the acceleration uh, at different points, and the color scale shows the potential. Uh, and so you see that, you know, these, these measurements in PAL-5 and GD-1 really help to, you know, because we see that they so closely point towards the center of the Milky Way, it means that the halo must be spherical. There's, they're not quite pointing to the center because there's some flattening from the disk, uh, but because they're so close, uh, that this means that the, the halo is spherical. Um, that's, uh, you can compare this to simulations, and, you know, typically because of, uh, because of uh, adiabatic contraction kind of of the of the halo due to the formation of the disk, you should uh, end up with a, with a halo that is flattened somewhat. Uh, and typically you find uh, values below 0.8, whereas we find that the halo is, is roughly spherical. Uh, so this is in slight tension with these simulations, but it's not a, uh, it's not a, huge, uh, a huge tension at all. Uh, so we have this very good understanding of the Milky Way halo. Uh, okay, so we know it's a, a very simple spherical halo so far. So now let's go on and and use tidal streams to learn about, you know, whether there's any small-scale structure in this, this smooth, spherical, dark matter halo. Um, so, again, the motivation uh, of this is, a very sp particular motivation is just this, this initial velocity of the dark matter. Uh, do we expect it to be, uh, is it completely cold, or does it have some, uh, some velocity that is relevant for structure formation on very small scales? Uh, so one way that people constrain this, for example, is by observations of the Lyman Alpha Forest, because if there's 
uh, some, uh, this is again the simulation where this is the high redshift uh, universe in warm dark matter and cold dark matter. So there would be much less structure uh, in the high redshift universe. And so by looking at the structure in the Lyman alpha forest data, you can constrain this. And so the best constraints on uh, like the mass of a warm dark matter particle come from, uh, from Lyman alpha forest uh, structure. Now, this is uh, essentially uh, the current bound is, is essentially equivalent to a suppression of halos below a, a dark matter mass of three times 78 solar masses. Uh, so this is, these are still pretty massive objects. They're kind of just below uh, where, we, uh, where we see uh, galaxies in the Milky Way. And so uh, you can't really do much better uh, in the future from the Lyman alpha forest because you're just uh, getting swamped by baryonic effects like the pressure in the interstellar in the intergalactic medium becomes important. So you can't really pre like do much better with the Lyman alpha forest. Uh, but then we can use these low redshift observations to distinguish whether uh, this is the universe that we live in or this. Like, is there, are there these very little clumps of dark matter uh, uh, and do they extend below this three times 10 to the eight? Um, so just to show you uh, what we expect to happen to a stream is here's again a simulation of a stream where it's again, it's, we're sitting the stream, the progenitor is sitting here and you have stream stars coming out of stream forming. And then sometimes a dark matter halo like there just ha will come by and perturb the orbits in the stream. And then these orbits will just start to, uh, they have a little bit of an extra velocity. Uh, and so that means that some stars will, will, will go away from the point of impact. Some will go, uh, uh, go towards the progenitor and you'll get density perturbations. You get perturbations in uh, where the stream lies in the sky. And so rather than being this very smooth stream, uh, what you end up is a stream with significant density variations and some kinks in it. Uh, and so by looking uh, for this structure, uh, we, can, uh, we can potentially you know, figure out how much structure there is uh, in the, the dark matter halo. Now, it's a very subtle effect. Like just to, to make this movie, I have to make the, the number of impacts like three times that, that you expect in CDM. Uh, so it's, you know, and it's, it's even then quite hard to see. So it is a very subtle effect. Uh, and so you need a very good way to compute this. Um, Okay, so people have been working on this for you know, something like 15 years. Uh, this has been proposed uh, a while ago. Uh, so essentially, the impacts are very simple. You just get an impulse. Uh, you just change the velocities all instantaneously. Uh, and the main effect comes from these halos uh, with masses of about 10 to the 7 times 10 to the 8. So they're in this interesting regime for warm dark matter. Uh, and it's very difficult to calculate what happens. Uh, people will typically run and body simulations again. Uh, but these are very expensive to run, and they will take hours and hours uh, to run to just do a single realization of a stream being perturbed. Uh, but it's, again, it's ideal for this action angle modeling, uh, because for every star in the stream, uh, in action angle coordinates, you have this very simple dynamics where the angle is just increasing linear, linearly in time. And then what happens when an impact happens, like at this time, it will just change the, it will perturb the velocities and so change the frequency slightly. But then after the impact happens, this star will just go off on some and slightly different orbit and again just increase linearly in time. So all you have to do is compute what happens at this point in our model and you can just plug it in and run the same kind of modeling as before because uh, it's all very simple. Uh, okay, so <laughs> previously we had just difference in action is constant, different in angle just increases linearly in time and now what we get, we just get a little additional kick to the actions but that's again just constant uh, after the kick happens, and then we get a little change in the frequencies that will just change uh, how, the, how the increase in the angle happens. So all you have to do is compute these for your kicks. There's a slight kick in the angle, but it's essentially unimportant. Uh, and then you just plug this into your model uh, and run it forward. And again, in like 30 seconds, you can build a stream that was perturbed by a dark matter halo. Uh, just to show you that this actually work, works. So this is a comparison between uh, the kind of density profile that you get for a stream, an n-body stream that was hit by a, a dark matter subhalo of 10 to the 8 solar masses. So you get this very deep depression in the density. This is essentially because stars move away from the point of impact. So you, you open up this gap in the stream. Uh, and the black line is the simulation. The red line is this very simple action angle model where we've just put in these kicks at the point of impact as these changes in frequency. Uh, and then these are the kind of kinks that you would see in where the where the stream is uh, on the sky, just as a function of one of the coordinates. And you see that we, uh, the, red, uh, the red is just a simple model in action angle space. It just completely captures you know, what happens 
to these, uh, these streams. Uh, and we can compute this for uh, masses down to 10 to the 5 solar masses, where these kicks are like you know, a few, uh, 10 parsec and like 50 meters per second. And we can still do all, you know, get perfect agreement uh, with these, these full n body simulations. Uh, so this works really well, <laughs> kind of surprisingly well in some sense. Uh, and so now we can, you know, this was for a single impact, but really uh, streams will, uh, will have impacts from tens of subhalos over their lifetime. So they will, they will overlap in where they hit the stream. Uh, and so, you know, there's a complicated pattern that'll emerge. Uh, and you can't just, in, uh, you can't think of them as just being independent of each other. Uh, you, you'll hit the same part of the stream multiple times, and there's dispersion in the stream that will mean that everything is kind of coupled. And so people do direct simulations, but they do like 100 and body simulations, and that already takes a very, you know, a very large amount of computation on a cluster. Uh, so if we could speed this up, that would be great. Um, so we can go back, uh, just to show you that we can do this really fast, actually. Uh, we can go back to my way of thinking of a stream, uh, which is, again, not the way that anybody else does. But in my way, a stream is, you know, has, is, lives in this parallel angle versus parallel frequency space, but the dynamics is very simple. You just get this linear, uh, stars just move linearly in this point. And so if you want to know, for example, what the density is at a certain point in a stream, what you want to measure, what you want to know is what the distribution function is along some, some line here at some, some particular angle. So you'd like to know, like, what is the density along this line that will tell you what the velocity dispersion is at that point and tell you what the density of that point is and such. If you, if you know what the distribution here is that you predict, you know everything about this. So to compute that, you can just run the stream backwards. You can, like, I want to know what the density is at some point along the stream. So what you do is you move the stream, you go backwards in time, and so you hit the last impact. This is the last impact that happens. So that, because of this linear evolution, to end up here, this part of the diagram must have been lying like this, uh, because this has a, different, a larger frequency offset, so it moves faster. So if they all end up at this, this vertical line, they have to be lying uh, kind of diagonal here uh, at this time. Uh, and then you just undo the impact. That's what it was just before the last impact. And then you run it back towards the previous impact, again, just linearly in this space, very fast. Uh, and then it was here. You, again, there were some other impacts that looked like this. You undo the effect. Then this, this line looked like this. And so you could just keep running this through all of the different impacts, and you'll just get some broken line. And then we have some very simple model for what the initial distribution is in this space, which is a Gaussian. Uh, so that allows you to compute the entire distribution function along this line. And so this you can do, uh, again, this you can actually do for, you know, in, in like 100 milliseconds or so, where a full, whereas a full simulation would take, you know, probably like a day or something on a cluster. Uh, so you can really speed up the calculation like enormously and run uh, thousands and thousands of simulations of this. Um, so now that we can do this, we can, uh, we can make, for example, some, uh, some little examples here. Uh, so this is, uh, these are examples of the density perturbation that you get due to the impacts of masses that are 3 times 10 to the 8. So just assuming that all of the impacts are due to 3 times 10 to the 8 with a number of impacts that's similar to what you expect in, from CDM. So you would get these very large scale, uh, large density fluctuations on large scales. As you go to lower masses, you get more impacts uh, and they, but they are more, less massive, and these halos are a little smaller, so they give you impacts that are smaller on smaller scales. And if you go to very small, like 3 times 10 to the 5, for example, you get these very little fluctuations in the density. Um, this, is in, this is where the stream lies on the sky, so just like the astrometric position of the stream. We'll also get similarly kind of large scale fluctuations for very high mass impacts, very small scale deviations uh, for low mass impact. And so to characterize this, you could compute, uh, for example, the power spectrum to just see where is the, where is the information coming from uh, to, to kind of characterize the streams statistically. So these are just the power spectra of or the median's power spectra of lots of these simulations for impacts with a single mass, but with the rate that you expect from CDM. So the high mass impacts, these yellow ones, these are all, uh, say, between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 solar masses, you get lots of power on large scales, but then almost no power on small scales. So that's just like kind of you know, this regime here, where you get these large fluctuations. So there's very little fluctuations on small scales. Whereas here, for these low mass ones, you get very, you get fluctuations on small scales. So the power spectrum of these low mass ones here, this 
blue line is, uh, extends to much lower, smaller scales uh, than for the high mass impact. And the same happens in the track, and you can compute the cross correlation if you want, uh, so they all look uh, exactly the same. And so essentially, if you can measure the power spectrum of the density along a stream, you can just read off the mass function uh, uh, in the halo down to three times 10 to the five or so. Uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, here's just some, what happens if you have a cutoff in the power spectrum, so it, yeah, just as you expect. So we run you know, full mass ranges of halos and run thousands of simulations here, and this is, is just as you expect. If you have some high mass cutoff, here's this yellow line has a cutoff of, at three times 10 to the seven in the subhalo mass function, some exponential cutoff, you would just get very little, you get less structure. If you put the cutoff at lower masses, it just cuts off at some smaller scales. So these are small scales here. Uh, and so if you see that there's some sort of cutoff in the power spectrum that you measure for a stream, you can measure whether there's a cutoff in the subhalo mass function. Uh, also, you got a bispectrum, which you can compute. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, OK, so you know that's all nice. It's theoretical. Uh, let's apply it to some data. So we have data for PAL5 and uh, some better data from CFHD that's better than SESS and that allows us to measure the density along the stream here, especially along the trailing arm. Uh, so that's shown here. So we have very good data from Rodrigo Ibada's work uh, recently. <clears throat> so here we are again from where we started at the beginning. Uh, so we have, this is the data from PAL5. There's this huge overdensity close to the progenitor, which PAL5, the cluster, lies at zero here again. Uh, so this is very hard to explain with any sort of uh, impact. Uh, so we just kind of assume that it's uh, because the cluster is very close to disruption and we just divide out some smooth, uh, we kind of do a, a filtering on large scales essentially just by, uh, by uh, fitting a, a third order polynomial, dividing it out, and this leaves us with this kind of perturbed, uh, this estimate of the perturbed stream. Uh, and then we can run these many simulations uh, for different uh, subhalo mass functions. So here's just uh, changing the overall normalization. Uh, so this is an example where you just have the rate that's kind of is that that you expect for CDM. Uh, and so you see that you get you know, kind of remarkable agreement between the density that you see here uh, that we measure uh, in the milk in, for PAL5 and this simulation here. So these are completely matched uh, to be in the same part of the sky uh, it, as PAL5. Um, so this was, you know, this was cherry picked out of 200 simulations, but still not that many. Uh, you don't always get this nice little bump. Uh, but you know, so statistically you see that it's a similar, uh, similar amount of fluctuations if you have much less substructure, for example, like only a third of what comes from CDM, you would like almost get no fluctuations in the current uh, for the current error bars. If you have much more, then you would get very large fluctuations. Uh, so we can measure the power spectrum. Uh, you know, it's very hard because there's a lot of noise currently, but this should all get much better in the future. Um, but so we can measure on large scales some power, uh, and then we did no power on this third scale, which is still informative, and here's just some of these, the power spectrum that we expect uh, for different rates. Uh, so you see CDM is like about this line here, so that's roughly what we find. We do some complicated inference here, uh, and we, 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 we get a PDF uh, for the, the rate based on these observations uh, that is basically just kind of one times CDM with a large uncertainty, and this essentially uh, tells us that there are 10 dark matter subhalos uh, between three times 10 to the six and 10 to the nine solar masses within 20 kiloparsec uh, from the galactic center. This is a lot of caveats about this measurement. I think it's very interesting, uh, but you know, there's certainly a lot of caveats. It's most robustly an upper limit because there's a lot of effects that could, uh, that we could mimic structure. And so really it's, it's quite robust that there should be less than 10, uh, but it's still, you know, it's showing you that there's, that we're already at a level that's interesting uh, for, for constraining uh, the amount of dark matter substructure. Here's just some, uh, just to finish up, uh, some projections for the future. So if we had measurements, this is a projection for a GD1-like stream. If we had measurements of the density down, that are 10%, good to 10%, uh, the noise in the power spectrum would lie somewhere there. And then these are projections of what the power is from different mass ranges. Uh, so you see that we should even see some power above the noise from uh, subhalos down to 10 to the five solar masses. So that's way, way, three orders of magnitude below the Lyman alpha force constraints that would really push up uh, these constraints on warm dark matter models and really rule out, uh, like completely rule out like sterile neutrino models for uh, dark matter, for example. And so with uh, future facilities like DESI uh, or PFS, uh, or certainly in the future, there's also 
uh, MSC, the Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Explorer that's uh, being proposed, uh, at 11 meter uh, spectroscopic uh, survey on a wide field, uh, on a wide field. Uh, so this is, I think the prospects here are very good uh, to do this and to really constrain the fundamental dark matter physics. Uh, so just to conclude, we have, you know, tidal streams are very kind of beautiful dynamical objects that are very simple. And because they're simple, we can use them to really make very robust inferences about the halo uh, and about the, the substructure in the halo. So we have these fast methods that we use to determine that the halo in the Milky Way is spherical, down to about 50% in the inner galaxy. And we see structure uh, down to in the, the density that indicates that there are subhalos down to three times 10 to the six solar masses in the Milky Way. Thank you. Great questions. Charles. So, so how far, how many orbits has that thing gone on? Uh, so we don't know quite what the, so, yeah, so one thing I glanced over is that the age is a huge uncertainty in this modeling. So in this, like this constraint here, for example, strong, like depends on the age. So here we assume that PAL5 is five good years old. It has a radial period of something like 400 million years, so that would be about 10 <coughs> orbits. Uh, but the cluster itself is much older. So one, one puzzle is why are the streams shorter than you expect them like from the age of the Glover clusters? Because PAL5 is like, I think it must be like 12 good years or so the stars, or 13 the stars in PAL5. So why is the, we don't know, it might be 10 good years old, but it seems unlikely. It seems like it's probably about 5 good years. You can measure this from the from the length of the stream comparing it to the velocity dispersion. What are you talking about length of the stream? It looks like the trailing stream was longer than the leading stream. So that's that's in the data that I showed, that's just because the SDSS survey cuts off the stream at both sides. Uh, but people have now followed it up with pan stars, and it does seem like uh, the trail the leading arm seems shorter than the trailing arm. But you don't necessarily it, because of the because the stream lengthens and shortens based on this orbital phase. You don't, you know, you don't expect them to be exactly the same length, but in these models, you can like predict what the relative length should be, and the, the I think that the leading arm should be a little longer than the trailing arm, actually, and so it seems like it's kind of strangely short. So there are like effects that we don't quite understand. It's, it might also be something about pan stars, but I'm you know, wary of saying that <laughs> too loudly, but it's not clear because you're really like at that kind of limit of what you can see. Yeah. That was a broadcast. Around the world. <laughs> <laughs> Why is there no dependence on the, uh, the radial profile of these subhalos? You only talked about mass. Right. So yes, true it's true. So uh, it's true that there is no dependence on the on the radial profile. So we have. Uh, so in general, like, so the width, uh, essentially the width of where you put features here. Uh, so that essentially comes from the the scale radius of the halo. So if you make the halo larger or smaller, it would kind of change these features because essentially uh, the width of the, the velocity kick is set by the width of the shape, the size of the halo. Uh, but if you vary the, the size, the, the size mass relation, so we assume there's just some relation between mass and size. But if you vary it between what you, the extremes you find in cosmological simulations, the power spectrum on the scales that we can measure it is pretty much the same. So the, like, so the small difference in like, concentration and that's due to the, that you see in cosmological, cosmological simulations, at least statistically, has very little effect. Um, of course, Pavel Klupa has suggested that, or found, that the um, uh, dwarf satellite, this dwarf spheroidal galaxy, the local group, are in a single plane. Does that mean that the action angle for all of them should be the same? So and if they have, that, you know, if true? they, so yes, if they are rotating in the same, you know, plane, then there will be structure in the action angle coordinates for those. And can you say if that's true? I mean, so I haven't looked at this. But, you know, it's just, it's just. I mean, action angle coordinates are just a transformation of position and velocity. So if there's, if there's a coherent rotation in a plane, then you'll see that in action angle coordinates. But it's the same statement essentially. So, and I, I do not work on the plane of satellites. So I don't really have any strong opinion on this. Can you do anything with Sagittarius? <coughs> Are these probing the most massive subhalos? Yes. Yeah, so the the kind of lore is that you know, for the the wider the stream is that you are only sensitive to uh, larger impacts. 
And so Sagittarius would only be really uh, sensitive to the, the very largest subhalos, probably the ones that we actually would be able to see. Um, so I think Sagittarius would be hard to use. Uh, in general, Sagittarius is a very hard you know, object to model, to screen. And you know, it's a large research project that's been going on for you know, 10 years or so at least. Uh, so I think Sagittarius is difficult, uh, but you can use dwarf galaxy streams probably. So an orphan uh, should, be, uh, should be useful. Uh, it's actually not entirely clear whether the globular cluster streams are the best thing to use, I think, because, in, because you're limited by these density measurements by just the number of stars in the stream. And so it might be that dwarf satellite streams just have many more stars because they come from a, a larger object. Even though they're a little wider, so they would be a little less sensitive, with more dispersion mixing everything together after an impact, it could be that you actually win by the number of stars. So that's something we still need to work out. It's certainly worth investigating, certainly the smaller dwarf streams. Any last questions? One last one here. Yeah. Uh, so when you model the sub-halo and stream interaction, it's always an impulsive kind of kick that you give to the action. Is there any reason to think that that's always uh, how the interaction goes, or could you have similar relative velocities in the start? Right, yeah, it's a, no, it's a good question. So we, in this modeling, we assume that it's uh, just an impulse, because that's, you can do the calculation analytically for the, that we use Hernquist profiles, and then you can do this uh, calculation analytically of the, the change in the velocity. Uh, you don't have to assume it, as you say, like if the, if, the, if the interaction is not as short because of the smaller relative velocity, this will not be the case. Um, my sense would be that this doesn't you know, matter statistically, but for any given impact, it might be an effect. So typically, when you, if you look at these n-body simulations, so the fact that we get very good agreement there means that this impulse approximation works well. And so we've done, and we've done many, many tests against uh, these n-body uh, models. Uh, so that means that in general, it works well. That it would be, it, it could be that for some impacts, uh, that it would be important. And so one thing I didn't talk about is that you can also, for the largest impacts, uh, you can just go away from the statistical modeling and, and potentially actually model, find all the parameters that describe the impact of the single largest thing that has hit the stream. Um, and then this might be important because it, it, that's probably something that passed by at relatively low velocity, so you've got a big effect. Um, and another thing that could, that could happen that I've worked out a little bit is that, uh, you know, here we always assume that the dark matter halos are just these like, round objects that are just like orbiting in the galaxy. Uh, but you know, many of those should all be in the also be in the process of being tidally disrupted because if these globular clusters are being tidally disrupted, they're very like, you know, co very concentrated, uh, tightly bound systems. Where you have these fluffy dark matter halos, you know, many of those will be in the process of being tidally disrupted. Uh, and if those are recently being disrupted and they pass by a stream, uh, it would still get us a velocity kick um, that would be significant, in particular because it. It often wouldn't be a simple impulse, uh, and that too, that's another exciting thing uh, to look at potentially. We could see a dark matter halo in the process of being disrupted. That would be very neat. That's why I was asking about the radial structure. I think right. that would make a difference as well. Right, yes. Yeah, so if they are more fluffy, they will be even more, uh, more easily disrupted. Yes. All right, let's thank Joe again.